Hello, everyone, and welcome to lecture 14 in our ongoing series on Middle Egyptian and hieroglyphics. This time we will be looking at some miscellany from chapters 7 and 8 with a special focus on the verb aha as a supporting verb. So this is everything else of any consequence in chapters 7 and 8. Uh, this video assumes that you have watched the previous two. Uh, that is to say, lectures 12 and 13 on the perspective and stated verb, respectively. If you have not, you might be confused by some portions of this video because they do deal with those verb tenses with the assumption that you understand them. If you either haven't watched those videos or don't feel totally clear on how they work grammatically, go watch those videos again first. We'll start by covering the forms of aha, uh, which do have some some real weight and then some other matters that are like kind of minor some of them are basically just vocabulary that has like a grammatical component that's kind of interesting other stuff is a little bit more important than that uh, that as with a lot of these like miscellany videos this one will kind of flit from topic to topic and be kind of faster than some of the other ones uh, this stuff is it's important but it's not nearly as important as the verb tenses the narrative past or narrative past tense is the construct formed with aha n beginning a verbal sentence, uh, especially the circumstantial past. Now, this is kind of odd from everything we've learned about in Egyptian grammar. You would expect that a sentence would either begin with the main verb in some capacity, like a perspective, or with a particle like you or mech followed by a subject or a verb. Well here, aha n, and that n is necessary, behaves as a helping verb of sorts that is kind of the main verb of the sentence. The grammatical parsing is a little weird. It's hard to, uh, to ram it into a standard formulation, but that's basically what it's doing. The auxiliary verb aha n is sufficient to not require a particle, and you can pretend it acts like a main verb. It's not any different in meaning to use sejim nf, but it seems to be used pretty much as a rule in storytelling and writing. This is not unlike the German perfect as opposed to the imperfect. One of them is used in everyday speaking, the other one used primarily in writing, especially in narratives and journalism. Egyptian, same way, you'd kind of use one form in a story and another form for all of your other stuff. And that other other stuff form is almost certainly what was mostly used in everyday speech. The other form certainly was used, wasn't invented for the sake of writing, but it would have been far and away the less common version. Uh, so here we have an example. Aha en sejemeni heru keri. Uh, so we start aha en. That is our our helping verb. Uh, and then sejemeni is I heard. You have two options in translating aha. Uh, one of them is not to translate it. This is think not quite as good, although dep it depends on the context. It can get repetitive if you have a lot of aha phrases. That gets rather old rather quickly. The other option you have is to translate it with the word thereupon or thence or then if you want to not have it be particularly fancy. My own teacher Dr. Donald Redford, recommends the thereupon approach. So you would say, thereupon, I heard, heru, the sound, carry in a bound construction, sound of thunder. Thereupon, I heard the sound of thunder, or then I heard the sound of thunder. The trouble with then is it kind of, it, it can make it sound like it's happening after, as opposed to right next. Uh, that's why we kind of prefer thereupon, even though it's a little older. You can use then as long as you understand the meaning yourself and you know what you're saying by 
by putting in Zen and how it contrasts with the Egyptian itself says. It's a, again, it's a little tricky, but unless you're doing a published translation, which if you are, you know, in the beginning stages of learning Egyptian, you're probably or not. Uh, any anything that conveys the the past tense sense is fine. You can also use the passive. Uh, this is identical to the previous form, uh, except that you use the passive form of the verb instead of the active. So there's no n in the past tense, and sometimes there's a w because it's the sejim uf passive past as opposed to the sejim nf active past. Not as common in the active, does occur. Not a lot to really say about this one. It happens, look out for it, whatever. More interesting is the state of narrative past, because it turns out that aha n doesn't just take circumstantial clauses. It can take any adverbial phrase, asterisk. The asterisk is it has to include a verb. It has to be a verbal adverbial phrase. There are three kinds of those that we know about so far. I believe it is the exhaustive list. The first one is a circumstantial. We already covered that. The second one is a stative. This is especially common with verbs of motion because then it creates this narrative past. Remember that the past tense of a verb of motion is accomplished through a stative that can work in the narrative past. And so you simply put your stative verb of motion after aha n, except stative is needed antecedent, and aha n doesn't usually take one. So now you need one. Either you're going to have a noun that's going to act as the antecedent for your stative, or you will append a suffix pronoun to the aha n itself, as in our example. Aha n e shemek shemeku chena f. So aha n e thereupon. I. You got a comma. The I, the I isn't really modifying the thereupon. It's just there as a, a convenient placeholder. And then we have it's written shemku, but in reality it's shemkui. I uh, remember it has to agree with that state of ending. So it becomes I went chenaf with him. Pretty simple sentence. Note the state of ending. In this case, the I was written. That's not always true. Sometimes it simply will not be written, and you just have to know it. Uh, the fact that it'd be Shem Kui is a pretty good hint. You could also have other forms of the narrative past. You could have an ongoing past. Um, you know, the I was hearing by taking a progressive infinitive form. This worked pretty much exactly how you'd expect. Same deal as previously where aha n has to take a suffix if it's a pronoun and otherwise you just use a noun. Very quick example, aha n e her sejim is just I was hearing. And it's always a past tense. Um, if you have a stative without a verb of motion, it's a passive form. So an example that Hope gives, Aha and Gerti. She became motionless. It's a passive. You know, so you're you're basically always using like a was or a became or something like that. Also, you could have a single aha n for multiple clauses. Um and as such it it's not the same as if like you had circumstantial clauses in a row uh, because they're not like the temporal aspect is different they're happening in parallel rather than in subordination so it's ba you're, you're telling a narrative effectively each clause happens one and then the next and then the next so you can do first clause and then second clause and then third clause uh, not like with the circumstantial, where the subordinate clause takes place prior to the initial clause, or perhaps contemporaneously with it, 
in this one, the second thing happens after the first thing. This is why you will understand this gets used for narratives because it's, it's quite convenient to be able to lay things out in the order that they happen. Quick note on adverbs. We discussed adverbs a little before, but it comes up again in chapter seven, so I wanna talk about it again. Egyptian does not have a lot of true adverbs. In fact, it is possible that it has none, that all the adverbs that you talk about are nouns, and when they do adverb things, they're actually doing noun-bound construction things. Maybe certain adjectives, when they take a W, behave adverbially in the way that quick taking an LY becoming quickly behaves adverbially. In any case, Egyptian is very, very sparse on adverbs. You could like maybe argue that like words like here or now are adverbs, but they don't even really work like that properly in Egyptian, or they might not. Uh, so instead, adverbs are done by adverbial phrases verb phrases that are adverbial in nature, and prepositional phrases that modify verbs. Those are the only adverbs you're going to find in Middle Egyptian, uh, other than a small list of select words, and even those might not count. Another quick note on the adjective verb. I mentioned this before. I think it was in either the perspective or the stated video, maybe both. They do come up. Um, basically, any adjective can be a verb, but only in certain forms. Specifically, you could have a perspective, a stative, or an imperative. And taking the English word good, you can understand how that happens. Using it in the perspective, it becomes something like, may you be well. In the stative, you can say, he has become well, you know, he's healed, or he has become good, he's undergone character development. And then in the imperative, you can tell someone to be good. In English, you usually have to use a form of be to do that, uh, but in Egyptian, you can just use the adjective as a verb in those specific forms to convey a particular meaning. Not grammatically any different from regular verbs. They conjugate the same way, they behave the same, but they're just adjectives, uh, the adjective roots being used as verbs, really. And it's something that can only happen in certain circumstances. Nonetheless, don't be surprised if you see an adjective in a verb spot, nothing weird is going on, just treat it as, instead of adjective X, it becomes adjective verb to be X, or to become X. A couple particular meanings of redi. Redi with the prepositions er and m means to a point. Uh, they're, they're the same expression, but because the r is the r of futurity, whereas M is in, a present, where D M could be appointed as, and where D R is appointed to be. Kind of hair splitting. Uh, like, yeah, important for academic translations. But for the purpose, for our purposes here, I think it's fine to just use appointed as or appointed to be in either case. I certainly would not take any points off of a student's assignment for translating or D error as appointed as. The, the concept is still there. We've also got a table of demonstratives, which adds a little information to previous stuff we've gotten on the demonstrative. You should already be quite familiar with the series of this demonstratives, pen, ten, and nen, usually also followed by, but not always, an additional n, meaning of. There's also the that series, which is the same, but with an f instead of an n at the end. So pef, tef, and nef, or nefen. And then there's another series, that it means this, but it also gets used in colloquial speech to mean the, and it ends in olives. Pa, ta, and na, or na, in. Uh, this is something they later develop into proper forms of the by late Egyptian. In Middle Egyptian, they were not being written to mean the, although by the later part of Middle Egyptian's history, certainly everyday people were using them as the, and they come in front of the word that they modify much like English the. Note that the N on the plurals did end up getting dropped over time. Uh, that was the other shit that was happening. So na N becomes na, etc. The third series, it's, it's supposed to say proceeds, not follows. The other two follow the noun. I, I got it flipped. Um, and the that series, sometimes there's just an olive at the end in the singulars. 
Like instead of Papa to be Papa, instead of Tapa to be Tapa. Just an interview. And then a couple of things that I kind of class as vocabulary items. Certain noun phrases act adverbially, uh, which should be pretty obvious. There are also some expressions and prepositions worth memorizing. Uh, words for complete. Uh, there's a little section on them. They're basically all idiomatic prepositional phrases, but they're worth knowing because they come up. Uh, things like to its limit, probably the most common one I see. And then a whole host of compound prepositions that are worth adding to your vocabulary list. I do not put any in here because they don't have weird meanings or anything. They're just vocabulary words. I believe that is everything that I had. Uh, next, we're going to be doing some examples. And I think I will probably, cannot guarantee this, but probably cover the section of the shipwreck sailor that is given as an example. Uh, before doing homework examples, because I think it'd be good to go over a longer piece. Probably take me a little longer to make than the previous few videos, uh, but hopefully I can release it before too, too long. Thank you for watching.